We're so glad that you're here. Now, I have two friends with me. Trinity. Trinity. Good. And? Eliana. Okay. Do it again. Eliana. We are practicing. We're getting good. Okay, what we're doing tonight is we are bringing to you the word according to Dad. These are all those sayings that, Dad, that you have told us that we are still pondering what do they mean. So, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. <laughs> or, bring back the change. Really? Be quiet. Can't you see I'm trying to think? <laughs> How should I know? Ask your mother. You are going, this is going to hurt you more than me. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, I told yours, didn't I? Okay. Uh, you, are go you are going and you are going to have fun. Who's paying the bills around here anyway? If you break your leg, don't come running to me. Okay. <laughs> Get down before you kill yourself. On second thought, go ahead. I'm not made out of money. Why? Because I said so. <laughs> okay. When I was your age, I walked five miles to and from school each and every day, and both were up hills. I wasn't asleep. I was just resting my eyes. Okay. Very good. Thank you, girls. Thank you. <laughs> They did really good. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we're so glad that you guys are here today. And yes, we are celebrating our fathers. So I would like all our fathers to stand up. If you're a grandfather, if you're a father, if you're a father role model for kids, like I know we got some of our youth guys in here, uh, I want you to stand up for, if you're doing the fathering because we want to talk to you for a second, okay? I want to bless you first and foremost. Um, you guys are valuable as, your fa you know, as being a father. And uh, it's not just to your immediate families, but also to the, the family of faith that we have here. You're incredibly uh, diligent at what you do, and we love you for that fact that you come and that you've uh, entered into the fathering role. And we celebrate you tonight not because you're perfect, right, but because you are willing to come to the game. And we deeply appreciate your leadership, the way you provide and you protect you know, the way you care for us, it means so much to us. And I know that in our culture, a lot of times you guys, as dads, you get put down and as granddads and stuff. And I'm so glad that you didn't quit, that you keep coming and that you keep giving of yourself. We couldn't be who we are without you. And so we want you to know every time that life knocks you down and you choose to get back up, we, we look at you as our heroes. You are our heroes. You're our champions. And we so love you, we so need you, and we want you to know that we're praying for you each and every day, okay? Now, let me just bless you. Uh, everybody else in the audience, why don't you just lift your hands towards these guys, and we are going to just bless them and bless the message. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here today, Lord. I thank you, Father, for the men that are standing, Lord Jesus, that they came to the game of life, and they volunteered to be a father, and they, and they stayed the course, Lord. And no, Father, they're not perfect, but you, are, you love them so much. And Father, we are honored to bless them back tonight. And I just ask, Father, you would continue to show yourself to them more and more. Now, Lord, come and make this message come alive. Come and delight them, Father. I thank you for each and every one. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, as you guys are taking a seat, there are some ushers and kids. They're going to come around, and they have a special treat that they've chosen just for you dads, right? And it's uh, beef jerky. <laughs> so you can be assured your wife will not take that from you. Okay? So yes, yes, fathers. We love you guys. All right, now we're going to have fun with you guys on Saturday night. I came, I did rep my team, right? Woohoo! So... Every Saturday night, we are going to do different activities, and we want our service to be a little different the Sunday morning. We want to be a little bit more relaxed and have some fun with it. So tonight, I am going to have uh, some interactive play, so beware. Things might come flying at you, okay? We have to see you, keep you on your toes. Well, tonight, I want to have a conversation with you about how we can bring out the best in others, how we can bring out the best in our children, in our husbands or our wives, in our boyfriends, our girlfriends, and parents, right? And also in, in our employees or the bosses that we have and stuff like that. There's principles I see in the Bible that talk about how we can apply those to our relationships and enrich them, right? And tonight what I want to do is take those principles and I want to apply them in honor of Father's Day to our fathers 
But really, these principles are ones that all of us can use in our walk in life uh, when we're trying to reach and enrich in those relationships around us. So on your outline, <clears throat> on your outline. <laughs> oh, hello, guys. Okay, Jonah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jonah. <laughs> okay. Jonah and his mom will be at each point throwing a football that has scriptures on it for you, okay? So you will see them again. All right, on your outline, uh, we're going to look at how to be a dad that the kids love, okay? How to be a dad that kids will love, and it's about bringing the best in your children. So the first one is accept their uniqueness. That's the first thing, accept their uniqueness. Now, this really is our starting point when we want to bring out the best in children or anybody for that matter. We need to understand the uniqueness that they bring as individuals. And so we need to be able to figure out uh, what, how, how, are, how are they uh, shaped? How are they gifted? How has God wired them up? And it's really our privilege uh, as parents especially to be able to discover the uniqueness of our children. Now, one of the best and most famous quoted scriptures when you're talking about raising kids is this Proverbs 22.6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. Now, that is a pretty popular uh, uh, psalm or proverb that we use often, you know, to, and we, we hear it quoted quite often with parents and stuff like that. And a lot of times parents think, oh, if I just train, you know, and get some scriptures or bring them to church, and that's going to be enough so that then they won't, you know, lose their way or get away from God or that kind of thing that they'll always come back if they do. And, stuff. and that's not quite what it's saying, all right? There's so much more to this. There's so much more. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that tonight. Uh, the truth is we do need to expose our children to the knowledge of what the Bible says. We do need to bring them into the body of faith, you know, the family of faith, like a church. But there's this part, and I want you to underline it because it really sticks out and it's saying something to it. It says, in the way he should go. And I want you to underline that, circle that, star that, in the way that he should go. The Hebrew phrase that's used here in the way you should go is really referring to being able to perceive into a child's life, into a young person's life, and understand how God has wired them up, how they're bent. And so we need to be able to understand that when we're working with young people especially. So what are some practical ways we can do that? Well, the first one is to be able to understand the stage of life that they're in. These are real practical. And the second one is to be able to understand the God shape that God has given them. So when I'm talking about this understanding the stage of life, what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about don't treat your preschooler like they're in grade school or don't treat your grade schooler like they're a teenager, okay? You need to understand the stage of life that they're at and then have appropriate teaching and, and training and how you respond to them. It should all be encompassed in this, uh, this life space that they're in. Now, all... Different stages require different things. Now, let me underpin this by telling you a story. You know, when my kids, they're all young adults now, but when my kids were little, there was one of them. <laughs> he was like maybe kindergarten, first grade, whatever. He came home from school, and he was sitting at the table. I was making a PBJ, and then he, he firmly announces, Mom, where do babies come from? I thought, oh, my God, it's here. You know, the bomb goes off, and I'm like, okay, I know the answer to this. I've been waiting for it, I think. You know? And so you're like, you're really, I was really getting it amped up and stuff, and I thought, okay, I'm going to go get my medical books. I'm going to show them. You know, and, and so I started plotting all this, and then all of a sudden the little voice go, why don't you check in first, right? So I was like, hmm, okay. So I decided to ask him. I'm like, so what exactly do you want to know? <laughs> right? What exactly do you want to know? And he goes, well, Mom, it's kind of like Christmas. You know how people send us gifts at Christmas, and that's nice and all that, but you know when they, say, they send us a gift card? When they send us the gift card and I get to choose? <laughs> he goes, it's really cool. And I was just wondering if I was going to get to choose anything here. I mean, I'm old enough, Mom. You know, and so I was listening to that. Now, as a parent, I thought well, the minute that question came, I thought, okay, I'm ready. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to be able to explain to my, my son exactly, you know, the facts of life and all this, you know, and give him an anatomy lesson. <laughs> and that's not what he needed. He just wanted to know, you know, I, I'm, I'm youngest here. Does it matter? Does it matter? Do I have a say? Yeah, right? And so we need to be able to understand that kids are in different life spaces and, and they don't need to know everything all in one big bang. You need to stop and you need to look at the stage they're in, right? 
and formulate your answer around that. That's how we don't, you know, make preschoolers act like teenagers, right? Or grade schoolers like 20-somethings. We, we appreciate the stage of life they're in. The next thing we can do to embrace the uniqueness of an individual, uh, especially children, is to understand their shape, okay? Their style, and to understand the strengths that they have. Now, this, this whole concept of a shape is something that we use here at this church with adult people, right? And the shape is understanding somebody's spiritual gifts, you know, how God has uniquely blessed them, like with leadership or serving and uh, administration, stuff like that, and the shape. So and the H is for the heart, you know, what motivates them, right? What just kind of makes their heart tick, like do they like to speak out for injustice, whether it's an animal or their buddy, right? Or the, their abilities, their strengths, their natural God-given abilities. You know, like some people are really good at baseball, you know, in sports, and other kids are, are really good with academics or music. So you need to know their abilities and their personality that God has endowed them with. You know, are they extrovert, introvert? They like structure, they don't like structure. You know, those are kind of the things we're looking at. And even the experiences that a child or a person has gone through, they will shape them. They will, they will in, you know, imprint on them. And we need to understand that because it all goes in with who they are. It makes them unique. And so a job of a parent or a father and he's training his children, is to be able to understand that child's shape and what kind of strengths that they come up with, right? And I mean, each and every one of us, we can look at, at young people and we can go, oh, they're good at this or they're good at that. Well, if they're good at math or sports, again, just get behind them and, and champion that. Or if they're in, you know, inventing things and being creative, show them how they can you know, channel those things, right? Now, here's the caution, though. Here's the caution. You and I, we have a bent. We have a shape. And a lot of times we want to take our shape and we want to put it on young people, right? Or even our friends and stuff like that. And so we need to really pull back from that temptation to do that and let them be who they, they're supposed to be. <clears throat> now, with that temptation to, to want to make them into what you want, you're going to have to have people around you to help you, okay? That's what I found, um, right? And so... There are people in the church, and there are your extended family. They are really invaluable, and teachers and coaches, they're the ones that will help you go, hey, did you notice that your son was good at so-and-so, right? And we need those people around us to help to champion. So if you're an aunt and an uncle, a grandma, a grandpa, oh, my gosh, or a coach or a teacher, you're invaluable. You help a parent be able to identify what their children are good at, and you need to be speaking those positive things and giving direction. So if you're in here and you're going, wow, a 301, that's a lot. I mean, you know, a lot on that shape. In 301, we do talk about that. Next week, I have a 301, right? And so you're welcome to come in there, and I'll help you to figure out how to find your shape if you're not sure what yours is. Because you certainly can't help other people find theirs or your kids if you don't know, you know, yourself how to go about that. So we give you the tools to be able to assess who you are, what is God doing in your life, and we're hoping that you take that and explore that. But I know as a parent that you go home and you're going to use that with your kids too, okay? And that's going to help to embrace uh, their uniqueness, right? Because I can tell you from experience, if God has endowed somebody to be an introvert, you are going to go crazy if you try to make them an extrovert, right? And it'll be painful for them and for you. So you want to make sure that you enjoy their shape, that you understand it. 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 6 says, God works through different people in different ways. He loves variety, okay? He loves variety. And so our task, again, is just to, to recognize the uniqueness of our kids. Now, listen, every kid, I'm going to say this, every kid just really wants to know that their dad gets them, right? That dad gets me and that he loves me and that he just embraces, you know, embraces my uniqueness. Okay, dad? So you have this this huge place to win a child's heart when you recognize what God is doing and you start to call it out. It bonds you like, like just like nothing else can, okay? Now, the second way uh, to be a great dad, a dad your kids love, is number two. Yes, Jonah. <laughs> okay, you said hi, hi, hi. Ready? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> See, I told you the front, you guys got to watch it. <laughs> Okay, I'm glad it's my friend. Okay. I know those that are visiting are like, oh, wow, I'm glad I sat in the back. Okay. 
Well, the second one is to affirm their value. And on that football, it talks about that. It gives you a verse. Now, why is it important to uh, affirm a person's value? Because everybody's starving for affirmation and, uh, and you know, somebody to, to talk to them about the significance of their life, really. Uh, it doesn't matter how, at what age. People need that, and they need affirmation. They need encouragement, right? Even Jesus gave that to us. He explains the affirmation that our Father gives us here in Matthew 10, 29 and 31. It says, Jesus said, not even a sparrow can fall to the ground without your heavenly Father knowing it. And you are much more valuable to him than a whole flock of sparrows. So what he's saying here is he's saying that you are very important, that you are very valued. And I know at Father's Day this time of year, when we go through this, that a lot of us, we didn't come come up with perfect dads, right? Uh, I know that's true with me, that, that, you know, that dads, sometimes they've got clay feet, and, uh, but we, we love them anyway. Here's the thing. You know, I think that, um, that God wants us to, to be able to challenge us with an image that he knows, that we know that God the Father loves us and values us, and at Father's Day, when we receive it, we can give it, give it out. So, we need to be convinced that God loves us, that God is interested in this. Because I can read that about the sparrows, and you go, yeah, that's nice, but, but I want you to see something. You were so important to God that he knew you, and he created you not out of a hickety-pickety way, but he did it with his own heart. He saw you before you were formed, and he was in the process as you were being formed. It says in Psalm 139, 13 and 14, God made all the delicate parts of my body, and he knit me together in my mother's womb, your craftsmanship is marvelous. And so what this is saying is that God planned you. Even if your parents didn't plan you, even if you didn't have the best parents in the world, God custom designed you. He allowed circumstances to come about, but he wanted you, okay? And you're very important to him. He's put his gifts, his talents, and his purpose in your life. You have great meaning to the Lord. And again, as parents, we have the opportunity to pass this God value on to our kids. Or if you're a mentor, you can pass it on to, your, you know, to the people that you're working with. So how do we do that, Sharon? Well, on your outline, how our Heavenly Father values us. I want to talk about that for a second. There are three scriptures there that kind of gives us a model for how we can show value in the relationships that we're in, especially with kids. Matthew 10, 30, it says, God pays attention to you down to the last detail, even to numbering the hairs on your head, okay? So he pays attention to you. He knows a lot about you. He knows every detail in your life, and he appreciates you, and he notices you. And this is a way that we can, we can uh, add value to our kids is by noticing them, by paying attention to them. Now, what's the way that we can pay attention to them? It's by eye contact, okay? Eye contact is so powerful to express that they have value, you know, when we stop and we look at our children, they have value. Now, I've told you guys before a game that I used to play with my kids when they were little, where I would tell them, because uh, I want to communicate that I cared a lot about them. So I'd go, okay, you know, I'd walk in the room and I had my eyes open. I'd go, oh, there's something in my eyes, there's something in my eyes. And I'd go up to, you know, David or Jeremiah or Samuel and I'd go, do you see it? Do you see it? And they'd be like looking, no, mommy, I don't see it in your eyes, right? And then all of a sudden my eye would catch their eye. And I'd go, it's love for you. Mommy loves you so very, very much, right? And so I would capture them, and I'd be able to deposit, and it came through the eye. Now, that practice, you know, would end with giggling and loving and kissing and hugging, but it formed a behavior, a place between them and me where they knew they could always look in my eyes and find that acceptance and that love. And I'll tell you what, when they were teens and I wanted to strangle them, <laughs> right? right? When their job as teens was to push away, right? To, to gain their independence. It was at that time that we had established, you have to look in my eye when you're talking to me. And we had this powerful connection, no matter how, you know, hard the conversation was at a gut level, they knew that I loved them. And I tell you, as young adults now, they sit around the table and they laugh and they tell on me, they say, yeah, mom, when you would make us, you know, when they were out doing something they shouldn't have done, you know, as a teen, um, you'd make us look at you in the eye, and then we didn't want to because we knew you could look in our soul. <laughs> and I'd be like, no, couldn't do that. You know what? Eye contact, very important. So here is the uh, application, especially for you dads. Put down the newspaper and the iPad or the, the, um, 
you know, the iPhone or whatever eye you have. <laughs> you just put it down and then look at your children. Look at them and be in the moment. I know your mind can like run away because mine does. Be in the moment and look at them and, and that really shows value in what they're saying. All right? So the next thing we can see in the scripture that follows is Hosea 11.4. I draw them to me with affection and with love. I pick them up and I held them to my cheek. Now, I love this because it talks about the importance of meaningful touch. Kids need meaningful touch. Heck, adults need meaningful touch, right? <laughs> we all do. And, and it doesn't have to be, you know, we all need it. Period. And we need to hug each other. Now, again, I think, especially back when I think about meaningful touch, we all go, yeah, I get it when the kids are small. But when kids are teenagers, right, it's hard. Because, they, again, they don't want you to hug them. They don't want to, to come and to have all that, but yet they need it, and we all know that. Again, listen, if you're a grandma, a grandpa, if you've got a, you know, the status of an uncle or an aunt, you know, or you've been privileged in the church to work with young people, listen, you come in at a time when they close themselves off from a primary source, and you can come in and you can give them those positive hugs or those po positive high fives, and they need that. They really need that. Everybody needs physical touch, good, positive physical touch. So, I know when I say that, I know I've met people who are like, oh, I don't want to be touched. <laughs> you know? and, and, and so I get that. Maybe you grew up in a family where you, didn't, you weren't allowed to touch or you didn't touch. Well, I want you to learn how to. Everybody can, and we need that. We need that to break down that barrier. That's why I stand back there and hug people, right? I look to make sure it's okay, but I go in because I want to make sure they know that, they are, that they're valued, right? That they're valued. And so we need to be able to break in that. And if you don't have that in your family, Listen, I want you to have an assignment this week. Go and do that to somebody in your family. Go and just touch them in a positive way, you know, whether it's a high five, a hug, or whatever. And I know some of you are going, well, gosh, my, my kids are like 30, 40 years old. They would, they would die. <laughs> they would never see me do that. Listen, you want to break the mold where there's a no-touch clause in your family, right? You want to you be a family that can, can actually hug each other, and, and it's okay to touch, right? And so maybe, maybe they can't exactly receive it, but I tell you what, their kids, you're getting ready to help their grandkids, okay? So we need, to, we need to encourage you to do that. Then lastly, the scripture in Isaiah 43, 4 says, God says, you are precious to me. You are honored and I love you, all right? So what we see here is that God is affirming us through verbal praise, through, through his words, and so if you haven't told your kid that you care for them, that you love them like this, that they're priceless and precious to you, you'll want to do that. And if you have a hard time talking to them, you'll want to maybe write it down in a note to encourage them and stuff like that. Words of affirmation, very, very important. You know, it helps to appreciate them. And we know that appreciation, what happens in appreciation? If I said my home appreciates, whoo, it went up in a value. When we talk to our kids like that, it raises their value. It raises anybody's. You're married to somebody you don't really care for? Try this, okay? <laughs> Try this. You need to give that verbal praise, that affirmation. That's what they need. You need to tell them, you know, even though they drive you crazy, that you love them, all right? Okay, so we need to be able to, to do that. And, and the Apostle Paul, we can see that in all his writings. Even when he's correcting, he's lifting up the value of, of the people that are, that are uh, being addressed there. Now, the third foundation for great fathering is Jonah. Okay. Hey, Jonah, come on this side this time. I think there's some people there that need the ball hit. Okay? Come all the way on this side. I love those wallies. Those are great boots, man. Okay, ready? Let me see your arm. One, two, three. Okay, ready? Okay, throw it up high. Go, like, right over there. Try that middle guy. Can you do it? He's trying hard. Okay. All right, let me do one. Ready? Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jonah. Appreciate it, guys. <laughs> Give Jonah a hand, yes. <laughs> okay, so much for our interaction. Okay, we promised to get better at our 4D presentation there. Okay, so the third one, the last one I want to talk to you about tonight is about being able to give people love, unconditional love, unconditional love. So we talked about, you know, accepting their uniqueness, about valuing them. Now I want to talk to you about unconditional love. 
And the way we show unconditional love is primarily through two ways. The first one is to always offer forgiveness. To be able to be willing to offer forgiveness when people hurt you, whether it's intentionally they hurt you or unintentionally, we need to posture ourselves that we give forgiveness. Now, guys, when you're talking about kids, um, when, they, uh, when they make a mistake <laughs> and it impacts you, it really hurts. It really hurts. So we need to know that, that uh, we need to allow our kids to explore all kinds of things to fail, right? But we also need them to know that they can come back and that we will forgive them and we're going to go forward again. This is an important, important note. Um, I want to talk to you about, just for a second, about kids and being able to allow them to fail. Um, first of all, let me state that I am a recovering helicopter parent, right? So what does that mean? Do you know what that means? Yeah, that means you're too much around them, right? You're trying to control all the things that are happening because you just don't want them to fail. You don't want them to, to fail and for that to hurt their self-esteem or something. Well, uh, I can tell you why I was that way, but that's not important. The important part is God took me to the mat on it. He took me to the mat on that behavior and said, hey, I want that stopped. So he challenged me. He said that part of his plan, listen, moms especially, part of that plan is to allow them to fail just as much as to succeed. That's part of God's plan. And so we need to allow them to experience those things in life. And I tell you, it's hard. It's hard. Because when your kids fail, whether it's academically or morally or ethnically, you know, or ethical, whatever, Lee, um, whenever they fail, it impacts you as a, as a parent especially, and it's going to rock your world. It really hurts. There's no pain like that which a kid can bring home. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So we need to know that we need to give them a chance to try stuff, and we need to know that they will fail. And when they fail, we need to be able to handle our emotions enough, right, and allow the Father to speak to us so that we can offer forgiveness to them. Ephesians 4, 32 says, Be kind and loving to each other. Forgive each other just as God forgave you in Christ Jesus. See that just as? What we have been given, forgiveness from our Father, we need to turn around and we need to give it to people around us. And I tell you, if you haven't learned it already, parenting requires mass, masses and masses and doses of forgiveness that you give out. It's kind of like marriage. Right? We need masses of forgiveness to give to people. So if you have a hard time with your kid, just know that, that God will help you with that and that forgiveness is the way, the path way that we need to be able to deal with them by loving them unconditionally that way. The other way is by never, never giving up on them. Loving unconditionally means I never, never give up on, on my child, or you never, never give up on a person when you love them unconditionally. In 1 Corinthians 13, 7, it says, love knows no limits to its endurance, no end to its trust, no fading of its hope. It, which is love, can outlast anything. Isn't that a wild kind of a love? Can you imagine to be loved like that? That is just inspiring. When I read that, I'm like, wow, that's what real love is. And so love loves kids no matter if they you know, get into drugs or they get into a bad relationship or they get picked up by the law or whatever. Love always comes in and it always uh, builds up and just, and, yeah, it doesn't walk out. And so this kind of love that I'm talking about, it goes way beyond a human love, obviously. You know, as humans, we run out, don't we? At least this human does. Okay, and so we need to remember what God, you know what God has done for us. And the Bible says that each and every one of us are sinners; that each and every one of us have made mistakes. You know that we've fallen short of of what He had for us, and and that we're in need of restoration and forgiveness. That's why He sent His Son Jesus Christ. He sent Him sent Him to us so that we would have somebody that could intercede and pay the price of our failures, of our sins, of our missing the mark. And so he sent his son to do that for us. And then he also made sure that in his son, we have this connection with the heavenly father now, this unconditional love that can flow to us and through us. And so this, this uh, love story I'm talking about, it's really what gives us power to be able to walk and to breathe and live as a Christ follower. And so tonight, if you haven't received that, at the time that I finish talking with you, I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to line your life up with Christ to accept the forgiveness he has for you guys, um, to be able to experience that love, that unconditional love that I'm talking about. Now, as a Christ follower, there are times when 
uh, our kids that do stuff, and we really get, like I said, it rocks your world. And so uh, you need to know that you can love your kid and not condone what they're doing, okay? That you can, you can be there with them, you can talk to them, you can redirect them, you know, and stuff like that. And the way we continue to love and still have boundaries and stuff is to be hooked in with the Holy Spirit. This also works for those that are marriages that are not that great, right? The, the power I'm talking about, this flow that I'm talking about, when we hook into God in this, this way, right, I can always know that when I'm running out of my own love and I start to pull on myself, when, uh, when, I, when I start getting irritable at people, right, or I don't have enough to, to love somebody, then I know that I'm doing it in my own strength. But when we go before the Father and we ask him to give us what we need to love in this way that I just read about in 1 Corinthians 13, 7, when we do that, he does, he comes through. And so it's not us manufacturing it, it's just receiving what God has, letting it flow through your life to touch other people around you, okay? This is very important that we stay hooked into the Father and we receive this unconditional love. If we don't, we can't give it out. In Isaiah 54, 10, it says, the mountains and the hills may crumble, but my love for you will never end. So it says the Lord who loves you. Now I want you to go and I want you to circle those two U's there. And I want you to put your name in it. So the mountains and the hills may crumble, but my love for Sharon, for you, right, will never end. So says the Lord who loves Sharon. This is a personal affirmation that God wants to give you today. This is his promise for you. His promise says that no matter what's going on in your life, no matter how much you're getting rocked, no matter how much the kids are driving you crazy, no matter how many financial earthquakes might be going on, God says that he loves you and he will never, ever, 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 ever leave you. See that? Isn't that incredible? Can you imagine? That is just so, if you really step back and you start to, to let it embrace you, it's just intense, very intense. This is unconditional love. And the Father wants us to love our children with that unconditional love. Doesn't mean boundaries aren't set, right? And discipline doesn't ensue but that we love them. Also, that we are to love our spouses that way, and we're to love the people that God put us in relationship that way. You see that? And so in a crowd this size, I know that there are all kinds of emotions that get kicked up when I start talking about parenting, you know, or I focus in on dads. And so I want, to, I want you to know that um, no matter where you are, no matter if things are like sailing like a you know, like a gem, or you're in a place where you're frustrated and you're about ready to pull your hair out with your kid or with your young adults or with the 30, 40-year-old that decides to leave his family, you know, or whatever. Whatever it is that your kid is doing that is, that is causing you, yeah, I see that, causing your heart to break, God wants you to know that he is here for you and that he will help you with that disappointment, with that pain, that he's here to give you what you need, even, I say that, even to lift the guilt that you might be feeling, okay? God is our partner in this. Uh, He's our partner, and so we need to go to him, and he'll help us out. You know, now I've been playing, I've been saying how to become a great dad, right? And so we're focused on these attributes, and um, really the secret of becoming a great dad, dads, is not to focus on that, to how do I be a great dad, it's how do I be a great Christ follower, how do I follow Jesus? You know, when you turn yourself over to the leadership and the lordship of Jesus Christ, that's where you find the greatness in the role of fathering. In Proverbs 14, 26, it says, reverence for God gives a man deep strength. His children have a place of ref- refuge and security. Guys, there's nothing like depending on the Lord to give you direction each and every day. That's how you love your kids. That's how you become great fathers. Bow your heads with me. Mm. Thank you, Lord. Okay. Father God, I thank you that you were here tonight, Lord God. And I thank you that there are 52 weeks out of the year, and this one you've called us to focus on our fathers. You say they're very special to you, that they actually get to carry the father role. Yeah. And so, Holy Spirit, I thank you for each one of them. I thank you for the, the men in this room. Lord, and I ask that you would show them their value in you, Lord. That you would show them, Father, the unique design that you have for them. Mm-hmm. 
and that you would value them, Lord, in a way that they can receive it. Yeah. And then you would allow them, Father, to feel the, the wind like you feel outside, that it would brush against them, Father, that they could feel your unconditional love that you are not condemning them for mistakes, but that you are loving them, that you want to bring them hope and a future, that you want to answer their angst where they are. I thank you, Father, for that. Yeah. And for those of you who don't understand this relationship of unconditional love that's offered to us through the Son, Jesus Christ, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now and, and I just backed off because I know that you need to make this step. This is why God brought you here tonight. Okay? You need to say, Father God, I want to be at your table. I want to be part of your family. So I accept your son, Jesus Christ, who forgives my sins, who forgives me, who washes them away, And I accept you, Jesus Christ, as the leader of my life from this day forward. And I'm going to pray for those that were praying that prayer. Father God, I thank you that you just seal it in their heart and that you wrote their name in the book of life. And Father, I thank you again for your love, your presence. I thank you, Lord, that you allow us the privilege of working with young people, especially this church, Father. I thank you, I thank you, I thank you, Lord, that you want us to be legacy leavers. You want us to leave a legacy, and you want us to deposit in our young people. And so I thank you for the father figures in this room, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.